the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Climate Change, Anarchy, and the End of the State by Eric Larson. The United Nations held its 26th Climate Change Conference, better known as COP26 last November in Glasgow, Scotland. It was the latest high-profile effort by world governments and their partners in the private sector to develop an action plan to address the disastrous impacts of climate change. And once again, it failed to make the tough decisions needed to reverse a 200-year pattern of fossil-fueled capitalist development. Governments agreed to begin reducing reliance on coal, but at the last minute changed the wording of the document from phase out to phase down. They promised to reduce methane emissions and shift financial sector investment to companies committed to net zero emissions. But none of their promises, according to one analysis, will be enough to limit global warming to two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, as stipulated in the 2015 Paris Climate Accord. Neither did high-income countries provide adequate funding to help the poorest countries adapt to a more sustainable global economy, or compensate them for the damage caused by the fossil fuel excesses of the biggest nation states. Instead, it relies on dubious mechanisms like emissions trading, which are designed essentially to guarantee capitalist enterprise a place in any new low-carbon economic order. On top of all this, none of the COP26 promises is actually enforceable. They all depend completely on governments and big businesses' willingness to follow through. Why has addressing climate change proved so intractable a problem for the state capitalist system, one that has more resources, knowledge, and power than any form of human organization in history? To answer this question, we must understand first the complex relationship between governments and capital, the nexus at the heart of the modern state. The origins of the modern state trace back not much more than 500 years. It began in Europe as both an idea in the minds of the educated elite and a competitive necessity for the rulers of the societies in which it was born. Varieties of states and empires had existed for millennia, but the modern state is not the same as the Roman Empire, ancient Egypt, or the successive Persian or Chinese empires. It has a distinct profile and distinct characteristics. Modern states create bureaucracies separate from traditional hierarchies built on class, nobility, or religious offices. These bureaucracies control a mechanism of taxation to fund the activities of the state. Modern states concentrate more intently and systematically on managing and exploiting their populations. They rely on standing armies and police forces rather than feudal vassals, semi-autonomous militias, or mercenaries. Each has a centrally directed foreign policy managed by elites and largely insulated from popular control, even in representative democracies. They forge networks of alliances with other states that, over time, acquire an institutional structure of their own. They invent and exploit new technologies to assert and extend their control more thoroughly and efficiently, and they tap into the power of capital to ramp up economic development and secure more of the financial wherewithal they need to extend and deepen their field of control. The modern state, in other words, is first and foremost an economic, that is, a capitalist enterprise. Relentless economic growth is its preferred path to power and its preferred means of delivering material well-being to its population. Capital is government's essential partner in securing rapid economic growth. Capitalism already existed in the activities of bankers and lenders in the cities of medieval Germany and Italy, but the formation of the modern state in the late 15th century supercharged it, giving capital a primary client with far greater resources. That client could coin and later print its own money, could open up vast new territories for capital to explore and exploit, and would always need capital services as it grew and became more ambitious. But just like the state, modern capitalism isn't something that arose naturally. It had to be constructed, subsidized, and directed, and it still does. The state couldn't exist without capitalism since it's the fastest driver of the economic expansion the state works to promote. 
If capitalism did not exist, the state would have to invent some other mechanism that fulfills more or less the same function. Likewise, capitalism couldn't exist without the state to supply rules, enforcement, guardrails, and to bail it out when it overextends and finds itself in crisis, as it frequently does. The conjunction of interests between the two is profound. Both need steady, perpetual economic growth to remain viable and maintain their legitimacy. Both are concerned with marshalling resources, animal, vegetable, inanimate, human, for this purpose, and nothing has enabled them to do so like oil, gas, and other fossil fuels, which enabled the enormous economic expansion that transformed the world in the past two centuries, and in so doing enabled the state to take over the globe. Because of their drive to pigeonhole individuals, communities, and nature as economic assets or liabilities, and assign a value to them as such, capital and the state have little motivation to grapple with issues like climate change, racism, abusive labor practices, or gender inequality, nor do they have any incentive to promote truly sustainable economic solutions. Ignoring or minimizing the significance of these problems enables them to rationalize a destructive energy system based on fossil fuels and the maintenance of a low-wage work regime for women and people of color. A feedback loop emerges. The state's demand for capital to grow the economy catalyzes and accelerates economic change, which makes the society as a whole more complex and in greater need of management, which makes the administrative and security apparatus of the state larger and more essential, which increases its demand for capital once again. To end this cycle requires getting rid not only of capitalism, but of the state itself. The Russian anarchist Peter Kropotkin put this emphatically in the state, its historic role, in 1896. Quote, there are those who hope to achieve the social revolution through the state by preserving and even extending most of its powers to be used for the revolution. And there are those like ourselves who see the state both in its present form, in its very essence, and in whatever guise it might appear, as an obstacle to the social revolution, the greatest hindrance to the birth of a society based on equality and liberty, as well as the historic means designed to prevent this blossoming. The latter work to abolish the state and not to reform it. End quote. Kropotkin was writing more than 120 years ago at a time when there were still large sections of the world over which the modern state had not extended its control, when the only forms of instant communication were the telephone and telegraph, when truly global banking networks were only an aspiration, when the fossil fuel economy was not yet global, and when anarchism, a mass movement against the state, was still expanding. How did we get from there to here? The short answer is that the state, including its most vital component, the capitalist economic system, has done a remarkable job of convincing us that the state and society are one. In other words, that the state is what there is, the only viable way to achieve the goals of community, which are three, a degree of personal security, a path to material well-being, and a shared identity, including a sense that one's voice is being heard. Personal security the state promises to supply through its police and military, a path to, a path to material well-being through an ever-expanding capitalist economy. But a shared identity, the most important of the three in some respects, it creates through a complex system of cultural hegemony, the key audience for which is what we call the core identity group, the ethno-cultural group that the state regards as its primary constituency, critical to its legitimacy and security. The core identity group, with the assistance of the state, seeks to absorb other groups, eliminate them, or else maintain them in a subordinate position. In the United States and Europe, the core identity group are people of European stock and Judeo-Christian religious background. In China, Han Chinese. In Indonesia, Javanese. In the Russian Federation, ethnic Russians. In India, Hindus, and so on. The core identity group models what's socially and culturally normal, is given access to education, opportunities, and influence in political decision-making, and is the reservoir from which the elite of the state and the capitalist elite select new members and leaders. Its definition of itself leans heavily on ethnicity and nationality, but can stir in other ingredients like religion, occupation, and even loyalty to sports teams. These dominant groups, the American social historian Isabel Wilkerson writes, quote, are surrounded by images of themselves, from serial commercials to sitcoms, as deserving, hardworking, and superior in most aspects of American life. And it would be the rare person who would not absorb the constructed centrality of the dominant group, 
or would go out of their way to experience the world from the perspective of those considered below them. On the other hand, the state also has a significant degree of power to designate or construct the core identity group. Every state does so almost from the moment it consciously exists. Capital plays a role in this process too, since capitalist economies grow by creating new needs and desires for new technology, new forms of entertainment, new ways to feel part of the favored community through dress, forms of consumption, and other personal preferences. Capital and the market have a keen eye for the balancing act that people in a consumer economy constantly negotiate between fitting in and asserting their individuality, and they take care that their offerings dovetail with the messages the state sends to the core identity group. But there's an increasing tension today between the promises the state and capital make, particularly as the drive intensifies for more rapid economic growth through automation and reduction of labor costs. Personal security and a path to material well-being are harder for the state to provide in a precarious, globalized economy that's disrupted communities, destabilized states, created millions of economic and political refugees, and driven economic inequality to new heights. Rather than change its growth-directed economic model, which is its central driver, the state relies more and more on the shared identity it cultivates for the core identity group, aiming to displace social tensions onto less privileged groups. Efforts to move beyond this pattern, even in broadly multi-ethnic, multi-identity states like the USA, repeatedly fail to get traction. Personal security and material well-being are also harder to supply when climate change brought about by overconsumption of fossil fuels is starting to rewrite the world's geography, rendering some densely populated areas unlivable and degrading or wiping out food production in others. The following findings provide some sense of the crisis the state and capitalism have brought us to. According to a 2020 projection by the World Bank, heat levels could rise so high in some regions, such as the Ganges Valley, that they become practically uninhabitable, and high tides could swamp much of Vietnam and Thailand. In just three regions, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and South Asia, as many as 143 million more people could be displaced within their own borders. And as water becomes scarce and farmland dries up, regional conflicts will heat up. The civil war in Syria may be a harbinger of this particular future. The yearly global death toll from heat alone will eventually rise by 1.5 million, while others die from starvation or conflicts brought about by food and water insecurity. Yet the state continues to subsidize fossil fuel exploration and production. A study by the International Monetary Fund calculated global post-tax fossil fuel subsidies in 2017 at a staggering $5.2 trillion, or 6.5% of the world's entire gross domestic product. The largest benefactors were China, the USA, Russia, the European Union, and India. The trend continues. Days after returning from the COP26 summit, President Biden, facing, law facing lawsuits from Republican-led state governments, announced an auction for 80 million acres in the Gulf of Mexico, twice the size of the state of Florida, to oil and gas producers. The growing power and reach of the state, combined with its relentless concentration on rapid economic growth, render it incapable of making and enforcing the policy changes needed to forestall climate change, reverse rising wealth inequality, and end exploitation of women, people of color, and the global South. Yet most well-resourced efforts to solve these problems still focus on the state as the field of play, and reforming state policy is the only realistic way to succeed. What the anarchist tradition shows, along with the evidence of decades of effort to enlist the state as an agent of environmental rescue, is that this is a mistake, and one we can't afford to keep making much longer. Reversing climate change must begin with abolishing the state not reforming it. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.